Section 2. The Age of the Patriarchs. Chapter 1. The Most Important Journey in History. History records many notable journeys that brave men have undertaken in order to explore the unknown and add to the sum of human knowledge. But there is none that exceeds in significance the journey of faith described in this section of our story of the Bible. The outcome of this journey has helped to mold the lives of men and women and the history of nations ever since. Finally, it is because of this journey that the Jews are returning to the land of their forefathers today. The nation of Israel has been revived, and the world conditions reveal that Christ's coming is near at hand. The story we have read tonight, commented Mr. Phillips, after the family had completed the day's readings from Genesis 11 and 12, is among the most important in the Bible. I am anxious that you should understand all about it, for it teaches us important lessons as to what God would have us to do, and helps us a little better to know God's great plan with the earth. As you have noticed, it concerns Abram, which was Abraham's name before God changed it. Do we read of Abraham very much in the other books of the Bible? asked Peter. Yes, replied his father. The promises of God made to Abraham are referred to time and again in the Bible. He is called the friend of God in James chapter 2, and the called of God in Hebrews 11 and Isaiah 51, the chosen of God in Nehemiah 9, the father of the faithful in Romans 4. And in the New Testament alone, there are over 70 references made to this great man. He is so important to the purpose of God that he is referred to in the opening verse of the New Testament. Would you read that for us, please, Joan? Joan read, The book of the generations of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, Matthew 1, verse 1. To Abraham and David God made great promises, said Mr. Phillips, and those promises will be fulfilled by Jesus Christ. Therefore, we cannot really understand the Bible without knowing something of these great men. And that shows the importance of these chapters we have been reading in Genesis. They take us back some 4,000 years. At that very early age, there stood on the banks of the river Euphrates a very important city called Ur of the Chaldees. Beautiful homes and buildings graced it, whilst in the center there was a very high temple at which the people used to worship. But though the people were very religious, they did not worship the true God. Instead, they bowed down to idols, and in Ur they worshipped the moon. In fact, Ur was one of the headquarters of this strange worship, and was considered a most important city in the empire of Babylonia. How do you know all about that, Dad? interjected Peter. In recent years, scientists have dug up the ruins of Ur, replied his father, so they now know the type of city it was, the kind of houses Abram probably lived in, and many other details. In such a city as this, Abraham was brought up. His father was Terah, and he had two brothers, Nahor and Haran. Unfortunately, Haran died, but he left behind him a son called Lot. Of this family, Abram was the most important. He was not satisfied with the foolish worship of the moon, and he began to seek to know the true God. He felt that some great power in the heavens must have created the moon, and that he who did so would be God. Did the family of Abram worship idols too, Daddy? asked Anne. Yes, replied her father. We learn that before the call came, they served other gods. That's in Joshua 24, verse 2. But then, one day, Abram received a message. How it came, we do not know. Perhaps God sent an angel to Abram, or he may have spoken to him in some other way. The message called upon him to leave the wicked surroundings of Ur, with its false worship, and go into a land that God would show him. Thus Abram was taught the truth concerning the one great God of the heavens. He did not keep such a message to himself. He told his wife, Sarai, all about it, and also his father and brothers. They discussed the matter, and Abram declared that he was determined to follow the voice of God and leave Ur. His father and brother and his nephew Lot decided to go with him. We can imagine what a stir this caused among their relatives and friends. They would have asked Abram where he was going, to which he would have replied that he did not know, but that God would guide him. And I feel that these friends and relatives would have probably laughed and jeered at him, just as some years earlier the friends and relatives of Noah had mocked him for obeying God's instructions. It seems as though people always laugh at those who try to follow God's ways, commented Anne. Yes, that's true, agreed her father. 
but there is much truth in the saying, he who laughs last, laughs loudest. When the terrible rain commenced in Noah's day, the people regretted mocking his warning message. And the time is coming when those people who today laugh at the truth will find that they, too, have scorned that which could have given them life. When Jesus Christ returns, all the heroes of the past, like Noah and Abram, to whom people once laughed, will enter into the reward. They will be raised from the dead and given life eternal. There were some who mocked Jesus in his day, and in Luke 13, verse 28, we have his reply. Will you read it for us, Anne? Anne read, There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, when ye shall see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves thrust out. With this hope before us, said her father, we can well afford to take no notice of those who laugh at the truth. It did not stop the family of Terah. They sold up their possessions and left the city of Ur, traveling in a northwesterly direction and following the course of the river Euphrates, until they came to another important town called Haran. This town was situated almost on the borders of the empire of Babylonia, so that to go any further would have taken them into foreign parts. The word Haran means roads or enlightenment, and illustrates the state of Terah and his family at this point. It was so named because it stood at the parting of the ways. From Haran the road branched off into three different directions, north, south, and east towards Ur. It was well named, for Haran was destined to be a parting of the ways for Abram and his family. But for a time they stopped at this place. Why didn't Abram continue his journey, Daddy? asked Anne. We are not told why they stopped, but we can put ourselves in their position and realize that they would hesitate before leaving the border of Babylonia. Beyond lay the unknown for them, where the ways of life would be strange, and where they would have to live in tents as strangers, surrounded by enemies, or as they were used to city life. Perhaps they stopped at Haran to discuss whether they should really move into Canaan or not. Perhaps they thought Abram might have made some mistake concerning the message of God. In any case, they remained in Haran some time. And there Terah died. And then Abram again heard the voice of God. Again it urged him to leave Babylonia, to cross the river Euphrates into the land God would show him. And now there were promises added. God told Abraham in Genesis 12 verses 1 to 3 that if he obeyed him, he would 1. make of him a great nation, 2. make his name great in the earth, 3. bless those who bless him, and 4. bring blessings unto all nations through Abram. Now it is important that you children understand these promises and to know what they teach. They have not yet been fulfilled. Abram's descendants, the Jews, are not yet a great nation. Abram's name is not yet great in the earth. The true blessing that God promises those who bless Abram has not yet been fully granted, and all nations are not yet blessed through Abram. When will the promises be fulfilled? asked Anne. They will be fulfilled when Jesus Christ returns to set up his glorious kingdom on earth. At that time, the Jews will be completely restored to the land and will be taught the truth concerning Jesus. Abram and all like him will be raised from the dead to life eternal, and the kingdom Christ will establish will cover all the world, so that all nations will be blessed in him, as King David, whose name is linked to Abram's in Matthew 1 verse 1, declared in Psalm 72 verse 17. You can see, therefore, how complete was the promise God made to Abram. It embraced 1. a national promise, 2. a personal promise, 3. a family promise, and four, an international promise. As such, it provided for the needs of all mankind and actually epitomizes the teaching of the whole Bible. All its doctrines, all its prophecies, all its hopes are condensed into what God promised Abram. Meanwhile, Abram in Haran doubtless discussed this second call of God with Nahor his brother and Lot his nephew. He urged them to come with him and obey the voice of God but Nahor refused to leave. We are not told why, but he would not venture into the unknown. Lot, however, left with Abram, and together they crossed over the river Euphrates to travel south towards the land of Canaan. He became known as Abram the Hebrew then, didn't he? asked Peter. 
That is true, and it is a very interesting and important detail in this wonderful journey. When Abram crossed the Euphrates, he commenced, as it were, a new life. He had left Babylon for good, and his standing with God and the people about him had changed. He had obeyed God's voice, and was now trying to live as God would have him live. To the people of the land, he became known as Abram the Hebrew. That's in Genesis 14, verse 13. We often hear this word today, for the Jews have inherited this title from Abram. The word Hebrew really means a cross or over. Abram was called the Hebrew by the people of Canaan because he had passed over the river into the land. That is interesting, Daddy, but why is it so important? asked Anne. Because, my dear, Abram became the first of many, many people who have crossed over from the ways of idolatry to the ways of God. In passing over the river, he was like those who today pass through the waters of baptism and commence a new life of probation in Christ. They can also be called true Hebrews, for they have passed over from the world to Christ and commenced a life of probation. What do you mean by probation? asked Peter. It means a life of testing or trial, to fit us for something. God was testing Abram to see if he was worthy of the great position he has for him in the future. This is also true of all who would pass over from a life devoted to pleasing themselves to one that is given to pleasing God. In the four men who left Ur, we have the types of all who hear the gospel message today. Terah died in Haran. His name means to turn or tarry or delay. He did that, hesitating to move on into the land of promise, and finally death claimed him. He was like those people who hear the truth of God, but put off making a proper decision in regard to it. He left it too late before doing anything about the invitation of God. Nahor refused to leave Haran. His name means snorer. In the Hebrew it's even pronounced like a snore. He was too lazy to act. Again, he is like a lot of people today, who do not want to act for God. Though he heard the message and knew the will of God, the attractions of Babylonia were too strong for him. Abram and Lot passed over the river in obedience to God. But Lot was drawn away by Sodom. His name means veiled. He did not have a clear vision of faith to sustain him. He was like many who hear, accept, and obey the truth, but drift from it. Abram's name means exalted father, and it was an index of his character. He exalted God as his heavenly father throughout his life. The journey of Abram is the most important in history. It can teach us wonderful lessons, and it has also altered the course of history. For if Abram had not obeyed the voice of God, there would be no Jews. Do you think you understand this? Yes. Well, let's continue the story. To get the best out of the Bible, we must try and imagine that we are actually seeing what took place. We can imagine Abram and those with him entering the land, riding upon the animals they used for this purpose, eager to see the new sights of the strange country. Abram is at the head, with Sarai and Lot his nephew, whilst behind him are the servants they had obtained in Haran, carrying their possessions into the new country and looking after the sheep and cattle they brought with them. They traveled south through the land, past Damascus, down into what is known today as Palestine. They found themselves in a glorious land, flowing with milk and honey, as the Israelites later described it. A land well watered by the rains of heaven, and in which were found glorious plains and majestic mountains and hills. Stately forests, smiling fields of grass and flowers, green and fertile valleys with springs of water gushing forth, revealed that indeed, this was a land in which to rejoice. At last Abram came to the place called Shechem, where hundreds of years later Jesus Christ talked with Samaritan woman in John 4. And there again Abram heard the voice of God. This time God said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. That's in Genesis 12, verse 7. In gratitude to and love for his God, who had cared for him and had called him out of the idolatrous Ur, and had made wonderful promises to him, Abram built an altar at Shechem, and there he worshipped the one true God. Abram stayed at Shechem for a while, continued Mr. Phillips, and then continued south to a place close to Bethel and Hai, that's in Genesis 12, verse 8. This is a mountainous part, 
and from there he had a glorious view of the country stretching down to the plains of the Jordan. It was a very impressive sight in those days, when the land flourished so much more than it does today. And again, in gratitude for the goodness of God, Abram built an altar and worshipped. Thus Abram wandered as a stranger and a pilgrim in the land, surrounded by enemies. Why do you say he was surrounded by enemies? asked Peter. Because the Bible tells us. It says the Canaanite was then in the land. That's in Genesis 12, verse 6. The Canaanites were a wicked people who had no respect for God or his ways, so that among these people Abram lived as a man apart. We shall see later how he rejected their favors and refused all intermarriage between his race and theirs. In this, Abram's life is a type or pattern of the lives we should try to live. The world about us is wicked and has no respect for God or his ways, and we need to stand aside from it. If we do not do this, we shall be drawn away from God, as later Lot was from Abram. We must therefore be on our guard. The reading of God's word, the Bible, can help us greatly. When we do this, we hearken to the voice of God as Abram did in his day. King David said, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? And he answered, By taking heed according to thy word. That's in Psalm 119, verse 9. This is true wisdom, and will stand us in good stead in the day when Jesus Christ returns, and all who have obeyed God's will are rewarded. In that same day the Canaanite shall be destroyed from out of the land, as the prophet Zechariah declares in chapter 14, verse 21. But there are no Canaanites today, Daddy, declared Anne. Oh, yes, there are, replied her father. Unfortunately, they exist on every side and in every land. They are those who refuse to hearken to God and insist upon doing their own will, even though this may lead to great wickedness. But the time is coming when all people will have to submit to God. Psalm 10 verse 16 speaks of that time, saying, The Lord is king for ever and ever, and heathen are perished out of his land. The Canaanites must have been a religious people, commented Peter, for they worshipped gods. They were very religious, replied his father but their religion was most evil and immoral. Accordingly, Abram had to keep completely separate from both it and them. The word Canaanite comes from a Hebrew word signifying a traitor. They traded in religion, their priests making a lucrative business of it, as, unfortunately, many priests of the apostasy do today. Those priests are modern Canaanites, who gain material profit from false religion. It is to them that the statement of Zechariah 14.21 refers. Mention of them is made in Revelation 18 verses 11 and 12, where reference is made to certain merchants of the earth, who trade in many things, including the bodies and souls of men. The Church of Rome is foremost in that regard, and is described in Revelation 17 as Babylon the Great, but other religions do so as well. How can you be so sure that Babylon the Great refers to Rome? asked Peter. Because we are told so, replied his father. Revelation 17 verse 18 describes it as the great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. That city in the days of John was Rome. But the church of Rome was not alone in teaching error, and whose priests get rich trading in the bodies and souls of men. Other churches do likewise. Hence Babylon the Great is described as a mother church in Revelation 17 verse 5. In being called Babylon, it's linked with Babel of Nimrod's day, suggested Anne as she pondered what her father said. Indeed, yes, replied Mr. Phillips. Nimrod set up both an empire and a religion, and later on, perhaps, you could read what he established in that book over there entitled The Two Babylons. However, you are too young as yet for such a difficult book. So let us return to Abraham and his wandering in the land. Did Abram remain at Bethel? asked Anne. No, as we have read in chapter 12, verse 9, he continued to travel south towards Beersheba. And then God sent a famine in the land, which drove Abram still further south to the land of Egypt, where lack of rain did not much matter. Why doesn't Egypt need rain? inquired Peter. Because each year the river Nile that flows through Egypt floods its banks, causing the water to spread on either side, covering the land sufficiently to grow all the crops required. This flooding is caused by the melting of snow many hundreds of miles away from Egypt where the Nile starts, so that it does not worry the people of Egypt whether they receive rain or not. 
Thus, when famine occurred in Palestine, Abram made his way to Egypt. But he went full of fear. The Egyptians were enemies of Babylonia, and Abram was worried as to what might happen to him. Sarah, his wife, was a very beautiful woman, and he feared that they might kill him in order to marry her. He therefore told her to say that she was his sister. That was not very true, was it? remarked Anne. Well, Sarah was a half-sister to Abraham. We read about that in Genesis 20, verse 12, so it was not entirely a lie. At the same time, it seems to me that Abraham at this stage, like all of us, I am afraid, showed a little lack of faith. In any case, God soon showed him that he should not have been afraid, for he would care for him as he had promised. But before we consider that, let us imagine Abram entering Egypt. The people would stare at this strange company of foreigners, with their quaint dress, their unusual animals, their foreign speech. Abram's supposed sister, the beautiful Sarai, attracted a great amount of attention, so that even Pharaoh, the ruler of Egypt, heard of her and invited her into his palace, at the same time giving Abram many gifts. That must have worried Abram, commented Anne. I'm sure it did, replied her father, and I am certain also that Abram would have turned to God for help, whilst at the same time recognizing his own blame in the matter. And God helped Abram as he will all of us if we turn to him in faith. A strange sickness affected Pharaoh in his house. He inquired as to its cause, and in some way not revealed, he learned the truth about Sarai and Abram. That must have made him angry, said Peter as his father paused. It did that, agreed his father. Pharaoh called for Abram and rebuked him. What have you done to me? he angrily inquired. Why didn't you tell me that she is your wife? I might have married her. Now therefore take your wife and be gone. He dismissed Abram, whilst at the same time commanding his men that Abram must not be harmed in any way. That is a very sad part of Abraham's life, said Anne slowly as she thought out the matter. Yes, agreed her father, but it is a very important part. Why do you say that? asked Peter, always ready to challenge his father. For two reasons, explained his father with a smile at Peter's challenge. Firstly, it illustrated to Abram that God meant what he said when he promised that he would care for him. Have a look back at Genesis 12, verse 3. And secondly, it reveals to us that the heroes of the Bible were men of like weakness as ourselves. If they were all perfect men and women, ever doing what God required of them, we might feel somewhat discouraged because of our weaknesses. But when we see great men like Abraham and David sometimes lapse into error and yet be forgiven by God, we can take courage in times of personal failure and turn with greater confidence to God. And there is one other little matter in the reading that we have just completed. You will find it in verse 15. Read it for me, will you? Joan read, The princes also with Pharaoh saw her and commended her. That is enough, Joan, interrupted her father. Now, can any of you see what I am getting at? The four children pondered the verse, but could not see why their father had drawn attention to it. The Egyptians admired Sarai's beauty and commended her to Pharaoh, explained Mr. Phillips. This brought problems both to Abram and Sarai, and it also warns us to beware of the commendation of the world. Jesus warned of difficulties that arise when men speak well of you. That's in Luke 6, verse 26. It is not the commendation of men that we should seek, but that which comes from God. So Abram returned to the land of promise, having thus traveled around the world. What do you mean by saying he traveled around the world? In those days, the world was a much smaller place than today. Countries like Greece, Italy, and England were unknown, let alone places like America, Canada, Australia, or New Zealand. The world in Abraham's time was limited to Babylonia and Egypt, with Palestine in between. He had thus really traveled around the world, and he became heir of the world. That's in Romans 4, verse 13. Because God promised that he should one day receive all this land forever. Abram returned to the land of promise, said Mr. Phillips as he continued, and made his headquarters in a place between Bethel and Ai. That's in Genesis 13, verse 3. There he and Lot remained for some time and prospered greatly. Their flocks and herds grew, until the herdsmen of Abram and the herdsmen of Lot began to quarrel over the land where they were grazing their sheep and cattle. This is a very foolish thing to do for they were surrounded by enemies, who, if they were to see these two men quarreling over land that God had promised them, 
would come to despise him whom they worshipped. Wright was on the side of Abraham in this quarrel. He was the elder of the two, and God had promised all the land to him. Lot should have given way. In fact, Lot should have told his herdsmen that they must not quarrel, and he should have remained with Abram under all circumstances. But the quarreling went on, and Abram could see that there was only one solution. They must part. And then he showed what really a great man he was. Instead of saying, God has promised me this land, and I will take the best, he left the choice to Lot. Abram knew that one day God would give it all to him, and he was content to wait for that time, without grasping for it in the meantime. So he invited Lot to select the land he desired, whilst he would take whatever remained. They were standing on a mountain when Abram offered the choice to Lot, having Bethel on the west and Hai on the east. From this high mountain Lot could see far into the distance, where the river Jordan flowed swiftly down from the north. The plains of Jordan were green and smiling, whilst further south were the five cities of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboim. Lot was attracted to the view. The city suggested the proximity of friendly companions and security, a contrast to the lonely isolation of life with Abram. Lot's wife was tired of living in tents and wandering through the land without any settled abode, as strangers and pilgrims, and craved for a little more excitement in life. The view before her as she looked beyond Ai seemed to offer this. On the other hand, where Bethel stood were the steep hills and rocky mountains of Palestine. They emphasized the loneliness and isolation of Abram's way of life. The eastern view down the slopes of Hai was attractive to Lot, but the hilly harshness of that behind him where Bethel stood implied the need of labor and effort. As he pondered his choice, the cities of the plain beneath seemed to offer a far more attractive way of life. We do not know if Lot was influenced in his decision by his wife, but we do know that later she did not want to leave Sodom. It therefore is possible that on this occasion also he discussed the choice with her, and that she urged him to select the delightful plains of Jordan with their prospect of a pleasant, social, friendly life with the people of Sodom. And so Lot made his choice. He selected the plains of Jordan, and left Abram to the loneliness and the hardship of the hills. Having made up his mind, he left his uncle going downhill towards Ai and Sodom. It was a very ruinous choice for Lot, because he lost everything in Sodom, continued Mr. Phillips. When he made his choice, he was standing between Bethel and Hai. Bethel means house of God, and Hai means ruin. Lot therefore stood between the house of God and ruin, and made his choice accordingly. He could continue with Abram, even though it meant little hardship, with the knowledge that he would one day attain unto the glory of the house of God. Or he could go downhill towards Hai, ruin, and Sodom. He chose that which led to ruin. I suppose Abram would have been a little lonely after Lot left. No doubt he was. But then God again appeared unto him. He was pleased with the unselfishness and faith Abram had revealed. And now he made a wonderful promise to him. He said to Abram, Look northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed for ever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth. So that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. That's Genesis 13, verses 14 to 17. Notice that God said that Abraham was to have the land forever. How is that possible? He would have to be given eternal life, as you said earlier, remarked Peter. That is true. Did he ever receive any of the land during his lifetime? No, replied Peter, for it says in Acts 7 verse 5, God gave Abram none inheritance in it, no, not so much as to set his foot on. Yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession and to a seat after him, when as yet he had no child. That is a good answer, Peter, replied Mr. Phillips, and I suggest that in the margin of your Bible you note that point, for it shows that if Abram never received the land in his lifetime, he has yet to receive it. How will this be, seeing that Abram is dead? By a resurrection from the dead, I suppose. Yes, that is right. Paul in Acts 26 verses 6 to 8 showed that God had in mind the resurrection, 
when he made the promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the fathers of the Jewish race. God also promised that Abram's seed, whom he said would increase until they were a numerous people, would inherit it forever. Can you tell me who they are? Would they be those to whom Paul makes reference in Galatians 3 verses 26 to 29 where it says, As many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ? And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise? inquired Peter. That is true, replied his father. All those who are truly Christ can therefore listen to God's words to Abram and apply them to themselves. They, like him, are offered the promise of eternal life on the earth. The psalmist says, The meek shall inherit the earth, in Psalm 37, verse 11. And again, Wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. That's in verse 34. Abraham did not lose much by giving it away to Lot, commented Anne. No, replied Mr. Phillips. God saw to that. And in thinking over this story of Abram and Lot, we can see the foolishness of quarreling over worldly possessions, or of being jealous of that which others may have, especially when God has offered us so much more than we can get in this life. Much needless pain is caused by quarrels, and as any parent hates to see it in his family, so God, who is the father of all those who believe and trust in him, hates to see it in his great family. The Bible says, let not the sun go down on your wrath. And that is very good advice to keep. Never go to sleep at night without freely forgiving any wrong done against you. And never make the mistake of continually thinking upon the evil acts that others might do to you. Forget them, even though right is on your side. Remember Abram and God's pleasure in him, and that he lost nothing by giving away. How much greater was his reward than if he had bitterly quarreled with Lot and insisted that he was in the wrong, as he could have done. Remember, too, how much God is prepared to forgive us, even though we have no right to that forgiveness. When the disciples came to Jesus on one occasion and asked him to teach them to pray, part of his prayer was, Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. What a terrible prayer this is if we are not prepared to forgive sins we are actually praying for our own condemnation. You should try to think of these things, even though you are young, and learn to forgive and forget when others have acted selfishly towards you. Shortly after Lot left, continued Mr. Phillips, Abram also departed from Bethel and pitched his tent under a great oak tree at a place called Mamre, where later the important Jewish city of Hebron was built. That's in Genesis 13, verse 18. There again, he built an altar to God that he might continue to worship him. Chapter 2 Armageddon Foreshadowed Daddy, said little Joan one evening, may I commence the readings tonight? Certainly, replied her father. This section is found in Genesis chapter 14. Joan found the place but was soon stumbling among the hard words found in the early verses. She could not get her tongue around Chedele Omar. Whilst the Rephames in Ashtaroth Karanaim and the Emims in Sheva Kiriathame had her completely at a loss. Perhaps I'd better explain the story, said Mr. Phillips after a while. It is a most interesting incident in the life of Abram and Lot. These kings, whose names Joan found so difficult to pronounce, all came from the direction of Babylonia. They joined forces against the five cities of Sodom, where Lot had gone to live, so that Lot soon found that the land which looked so pleasant and inviting from a distance was actually full of trouble and war. On the other hand, Abram, living his life of separateness in the hilly country of Palestine, was not worried by these things. Sodom was defeated in the war, and with her companion cities was put under tribute. The people endured this for twelve years, and then revolted. Poor Lot thus found himself again in the midst of trouble. This time it was more serious. King Chedele Omar had gathered a stronger force than ever and invaded the country again. The king of Sodom brought out his army to resist, but was defeated, and the army from the north, taking the people captive and seizing all the goods they could, commenced its return, feeling they had conquered Sodom for good. And among these captives was Lot. Thus it was that one day Abram was startled to learn of this bad news. He was not concerned with the fate of Sodom, 
but when he heard that Lot was among the captives, he armed his trained men in his house and raced to the rescue. He met with the invading army in the north of Palestine and defeated it in battle, before chasing it north as far as Damascus, where Chedorlaomer was completely beaten. And so Abram returned as a conqueror, restoring Lot to freedom and returning the possession of the people of Sodom. As he was returning to Mamre, where he was stopping for the time being, he passed by the city of Salem, as Jerusalem was then called. And there happened to be a remarkable incident. It is recorded in verse 18. Will you read it, please, Anne? Anne read, And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. Salem means peace. So here was a man called Melchizedek, who was both king and priest in Jerusalem, as Jesus Christ will be one day. Does that mean that Melchizedek was a worshipper of the true God? asked Anne. Yes, replied her father. Paul says that Jesus Christ was made a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, showing that he was undoubtedly a worshipper of the true God. That's in Hebrews 7 verse 17. Well, that means that Abram was not the only believer in those days. That is true. Melchizedek was a believer. And it is possible that there were others. Some think that Job lived in the days of Abraham, although we cannot be sure of this. In any case, true believers were but a few in number. What does Melchizedek mean? asked Peter. The word is made up of two words, Melchi, king, and Zadok, righteousness, and means king of righteousness. Melchizedek was thus king of righteousness and king of peace. That's what it says in Hebrews chapter 7 verse 2. And these are the titles to be one day used by Jesus Christ when he reigns in Jerusalem as king-priest. So here we have Abram, after the invading host from the north has been defeated, being blessed by a man who foreshadowed Jesus Christ and accepting from his hands bread and wine, as he praised the God of heaven and earth because of the great victory he had granted to that man of faith. Would that have anything to do with the bread and wine which is used to remember Christ in the memorial meeting each Sunday? asked Peter. I believe it has. When Jesus gives bread and wine to his disciples for this purpose 1900 years ago, he said, I will not any more partake of it until the kingdom of God has come. That's in Luke 22 verse 18. When that day comes, Abraham will be present with the members of his household. There will have been a great invasion from the north which will be destroyed, which we read of in Ezekiel chapter 38, and the Lord Jesus, as Melchizedek, will again offer bread and wine as a symbol of the great victory over sin and death. It says that Abram gave Melchizedek tithes of all. What does that mean? A tithe is a tenth, and Abram gave this to Melchizedek because he was God's priest. Abraham liked to be generous towards God because God had been generous towards him. We need to remember that always, for if we are generous towards God, he will never forget us. Abram manifested his respect for God in another way also. We read in verses 21 to 23 that the king of Sodom wanted to reward Abram for his action in saving the people. But Abram refused his offer because he had promised God that he would not seek the help of man in that way. He kept himself quite separate from the Canaanites and refused even their favors. Abram was a man who gave his life completely to God. Chapter 3. The Covenant Confirmed This is a strange chapter, remarked Anne after the family had read Genesis 15. I don't know what it's about. It is one of the most beautiful chapters in Genesis, remarked her father. See how God revealed himself to Abram as a loving, heavenly father in proclaiming himself as his friend, protector, and rewarder in verse 1? And notice how he answers both the questions put to him by the patriarch. God had promised Abram that he would become the father of numerous children. But many years had passed, and he hadn't even one son. No wonder he inquired, Who is to be my heir? How impressive was the answer of God. The angel took Abram outside into the night, and pointing to the Palestinian sky from where innumerable stars could be seen twinkling and gleaming in the darkness, he declared, So shall thy seed be. Abram must have been impressed with the sight, and we should be also. Whenever we see the stars above in all their glory and beauty, and in all their great numbers, we should remember this scene in Genesis chapter 15. 
And we should remember, too, that if we would aspire to be true sons and daughters of Abram, we should be like the stars, shining out from the darkness of our surroundings. Abram was impressed, as you will see if you read verse 6 again. Anne read, And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Yes, Abram honored God, not merely in believing that he existed, but acknowledging that he was able to do what he had promised. As Paul says, he was fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was able to perform. That's in Romans 4 verse 21. God then reminded Abram of his promise. He declared, I brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land to inherit it. But Abram was growing old and therefore he asked, Whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? This seems as though Abram doubted God, doesn't it? No, the word whereby means by what sign. Abram was growing old, and he knew that he must die, and desired a sign that would teach him how God would fulfill his purpose. God is always pleased when we seek to know more of how and why he will establish his plan on the earth. What was the sign? He told Abram to take a calf, a goat, a ram, a dove, and a pigeon, and slaying them to divide the animals into two parts laying each piece one against another. Abram had to protect this sacrifice until an horror of great darkness fell upon him, and then, in the midst of the darkness, a smoking furnace and a burning light passed between the pieces. That was a strange thing, wasn't it? It may seem so to us, but Abram would know what it all meant. That was the way in which a covenant or agreement was ratified in ancient times. What do you mean by ratified? To ratify anything is to make it sure. We ratify an agreement today when we sign that we will honor it. But in ancient times, this was done by way of sacrifice. You can see that in Genesis 21, verses 29 to 32, for example. The bodies of animals were divided into two parts, and the people making the covenant passed between the two parts. Meeting in the middle, they took an oath to keep to the agreement. You can also see Jeremiah chapter 34, verse 18. Why were the animals divided in two? To represent the two parties to the agreement. Why were the animals slain? To show that each of the contracting parties was prepared to give his life to keep the covenant. But there was only one party in Genesis 15, only Abram. No, there were two parties, Abram and God. But first, after Abram had slain the animals, he laid them out as directed, and he had to protect them from the birds until he could do so no longer, for a deep sleep came upon him. This showed that Abram would keep his part of the covenant until he died. Whilst Abram slept, he heard the voice of God telling him that his descendants would be afflicted for four hundred years in a foreign land, but should finally be delivered by God and brought into the promised land again, and that Abram himself would die and be buried. That showed that God would keep his part of the covenant after the death of Abram, but where was God represented in the sacrifice? That is shown in verse 17. When the great darkness which represented death came upon Abram, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp passed between the pieces of the slain animals. That was the symbol of God's presence. You can see that, for example, in Revelation 4 verse 5. It showed Abram that after he had died, God would ratify or make sure the covenant with him through the covenant victim whom he would provide. That is very hard to understand. What do you mean by the covenant victim God would provide? The covenant victim, as I told you earlier, was the animal that was slain to make sure the covenant. The sacrifice made it sure because it represented both parties to the agreement as promising to keep it with their lives. The sacrifice that Abram made pointed forward to the Lord Jesus Christ, who was the covenant victim provided by God. His death and resurrection confirmed the promises made unto the fathers. Just before his death, when he met with his disciples for the last time, he gave them some bread and wine as a token of this. The bread, he told them, represented his body which was to be crucified, and the blood represented his life which he had poured out in a dedicated service unto God. Christ rendered perfect obedience unto his Father, and therefore he was raised from the dead to eternal life. In so doing, he led the way for others to follow. By his resurrection, God ratified, or made sure, the covenant he had made earlier with Abram. If he had to render perfect obedience in order to obtain a resurrection unto eternal life, how can we receive it, seeing we sin? asked Graham. 
Abram sinned as well, as we learned when we read of his adventures in Egypt, replied his father. But through Christ Jesus, he received the forgiveness of sins. He looked to the coming of Christ. And Paul teaches that the effectiveness of Christ's offerings reaches back as well as forward. Those who embrace the truth in faith receive forgiveness of sins in Christ, whether living in Abram's day or in ours. Why did Abram have to offer three different animals as well as birds? inquired Anne. The animals he offered represented all the different kinds of animals offered under the law of Moses, explained her father. And all the sacrifices under the law pointed forward to the work accomplished in Christ. They were types foreshadowing the wonderful work of redemption he would accomplish. The heifer was used as purification from death, that's in Numbers 19 verse 2, and therefore from mortality. The she-goat was offered for sins of ignorance, Numbers 15 verse 27 and therefore it is a reminder of the weakness of human nature. And the ram was used for consecration. That's in Exodus 29, verse 15. Each in turn play an important role. We must remember that we are mortal, that we are sinful, and that we are expected to give ourselves unto God, and all that was expressed in the sacrifices. The birds were the offering of poverty, Leviticus 1, verse 14, and they were also offered when a baby was born, Luke 2, verse 24. Accordingly, Abram was told that the most humble can find acceptance with God, particularly when they manifest the qualities of a new life in him. Now, before leaving the chapter, notice that the promises contained therein still await complete fulfillment. As recorded in verse 18, God promised that he would give to the descendants of Abram all the land between the Euphrates and the Nile, around the borders of which Abram had traveled. At no stage has Israel possessed all that land. But the time is coming when God will give it unto the nation, and the Jewish people shall acknowledge their king, even Jesus Christ. This, of course, will be at his coming. Chapter 4 The Son of Laughter and Joy Though Abram was promised a seed as numerous as the stars of heaven, he had only one son by his wife Sarai. Upon this son he lavished all his love and affection, for he knew that through him would come that one, the Lord Jesus, who would fulfill the great and glorious promises God had made. Year after year passed, and though God had promised Abram that he would develop into a numerous people, he remained childless. Sarai, too, was very anxious that Abram should have a son. Finally, in desperation, she told him to take a slave wife, an Egyptian named Hagar, who was her handmaid. It was quite usual in those days for men to have more than one wife, and so Abram agreed, and to Hagar a baby boy was born, and they named him Ishmael, which means, whom God hears. God declared that this boy would grow into a numerous people, and he would be a wild man, His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of his brethren. Genesis 16, verse 12. From Ishmael came the Arab people, who have developed as God said they would, into a numerous people, and who are, as he described them, a wild, untamed people, very fond of fighting, and often found quarreling among themselves. The son of Hagar, therefore, did not answer to the requirements of the son God had promised Abram. Thirteen long years passed, and still no son was born to Sarai. And then, again, God appeared to Abram. He told him that he would be the father of many nations, that kings would come from him, and that Abram, together with his children after him, would inherit the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. Genesis 17, verses 4-8 through The numerous offspring thus promised Abraham is not limited to his descendants of the Jewish people but also includes those Gentiles who embrace the hope of Israel. Acts 28, verse 20. About 2,000 years after God made this promise to Abram, Jesus Christ told the leaders of the Jews that they were not the promised seed because they did not act faithfully as Abram did. John 8, verse 39. He declared, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Matthew 21, verse 43. 
Therefore, later, when the gospel was preached to Gentiles, Paul taught that those who were baptized and lived a life of faith were Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Galatians 3 verse 29. Such people, no matter what nation out of which they may be called, are described as the true Israel of God. Galatians 6 verse 16. The true seed of Abraham, therefore, are to be found among both Jews and Gentiles. Their essential quality is an acceptance of the promises made to Abraham and the manifestation of his faith in regard to them. They are those who worship God in truth and humble themselves before him. He delights in such people and seeketh such to worship him. John 4 verse 23. In time to come, God will exalt them and make them kings with his great son. Revelation 5 verses 9 and 10. So that the promise of Abram will be fulfilled, kings shall come out of thee. Genesis 17 verse 6. This was a very notable occasion in the life of Abram, for God now changed his name. Thy name shall no more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. Genesis 17 verse 5. Abba is the Jewish word for father. Abram means lofty father, but Abraham means father of a multitude. In thus changing his name, God revealed to Abraham that he was to become a leader of a multitude, a father of the faithful, as Paul calls him. As a token of his covenant, God gave to Abraham the right of circumcision. Circumcision is the cutting off of flesh. It became a law to the Jews, Leviticus 12 verse 3, but it was only a sign reminding them that they should cut off their sins to be circumcised at heart, Deuteronomy 30 verse 6 and Romans 2 verse 29. Today, anyone who puts on Christ by baptism and tries to live a godly life is accounted as being circumcised, Colossians 2 verse 11, and therefore joined to the covenant God made with Abraham. God also changed the name of Sarai. She was now to be called Sarah, meaning princess. And God declared, I will bless her, and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Genesis 17, verse 16. By this promise, Abraham was shown that the promised offspring should not come through Ishmael, but through the son of Sarah. It was almost unbelievable to Abraham that a couple so old as he and Sarah should have a son. Nevertheless, the prospect filled him with great joy and pleasure. But he did not want Ishmael to be neglected. He had learned to love the boy, who was now thirteen years of age, for he too was his son. And so he pleaded for a blessing on him also. And God granted his request. The son of promise was to be Sarah's son, whom they were to name Isaac, which means laughter or joy. But God also said that he would bless Ishmael, whom he would multiply into a great nation, and that twelve princes would come from him. So Abram was to have two sons. One was the son of a bondwoman, the other the son of a free woman. Both were to have numerous offspring. The son of the bondwoman was to develop into a people who would always find themselves in trouble. Genesis 16 verse 12. But whose prayers... God would hear, the meaning of Ishmael, and who would finally become a great nation ruled by twelve princes. Genesis 17 verse 20. The son of the free woman was also to become a numerous people who would rule over their fellows and inherit the land with Abraham forever. Nineteen hundred years after God appeared to Abraham, the Apostle Paul wrote concerning Ishmael and Isaac and said that there is a hidden meaning in all these things. Ishmael was likened to the natural descendants of Abraham, the Jewish people. Isaac was likened to the spiritual seed of Abraham, those, both Jews and Gentiles, who try to worship God in truth and follow Jesus Christ. Galatians 4 verses 22 to 26. Thus, although the prophecies made to Abraham concerning his eldest son Ishmael were fulfilled in the Arab people, they also concerned the Jewish nation. By allegory, God was showing Abraham his purpose to be revealed in the future. People who live in the country, away from contact with other people, know how pleasant it is to receive visitors, especially if they have common interests. It gives them the chance to hear the latest news and discuss those things in which they are interested. So declared Mr. Phillips after the family had read Genesis 18. 
For some time, he continued, your mother and I lived in a place that was very isolated. Visitors were few and far between, and contact with ecclesial life almost ceased. It was a great joy when we were visited by any of the brethren. That was the case with Abraham, as we just read. With his vast household and great flocks and herds, he had pitched his tent under a great oak tree in Mamre. Suddenly a servant approached Abraham and announced that three men were approaching his encampment. It was a burning hot day, and Abraham knew that they would be tired. With typical friendliness and hospitality, he went forth to meet them. Bowing low before them, as was the custom in those days, he invited them to break their journey with him and refresh themselves. Abraham did not know that they were angels sent by God to visit him. He thought that they were ordinary men, mere strangers, traveling through the land. Out of the kindness of his heart, he asked them to rest a while. His friendly action was later praised by Paul and held out as an example for all to follow. You can read about that in Hebrews 13 verse 2. Abraham led the strangers to the shade of the tree under which he had pitched his tent, in order that they might enjoy their rest. Then, hastening into Sarah, he told her of the visitors, and, full of kindness, went and fetched a calf from the herd to prepare a meal for them. Sarah was soon cooking a fine roast dinner for them. Meanwhile, Abraham enjoyed the conversation with them outside the tent. In the course of this, however, the visitors made a statement that startled their hosts. They declared, Sarah will have a son as God has promised. Sarah, still inside the tent preparing the meal, but possibly trying to listen to the conversation at the same time, heard the message and laughed. Many years had passed since she first had hoped for a son. Many times she and Abraham had discussed the promise that God had made with them, but now she believed it was too late. She was too old to have a son. And so, as she continued her preparations and listened to the conversation of the men without, she laughed within herself. But then she received a shock. The visitors made a remark that showed that they were not ordinary men for whom she was preparing the meal. She heard them say to her husband, What makes Sarah laugh? Is anything too hard for God? So taken aback was she at this, that she left her task for a moment and going outside, denied that she had laughed. Oh, yes, you did, the angels replied. Next year the promised son was born, as the angels had declared. He was called Isaac, which means laughter. Sarah, remembering her strange visitors, and in her great joy declared, God hath made me to laugh, so that all that hear will laugh with me. Genesis 21, verse 6. Daddy, interrupted Anne at this stage, what did Sarah mean by that? The expression used by Sarah can mean to laugh in doubt, or to laugh in the abundance of joy. Something like we read in Luke 24, verse 41, where it is written that the disciples were so overcome with good news of the resurrection of Jesus that it is said they believed not for joy. Sarah expressed her great joy in the birth of her little boy and added that all who look for the fulfillment of the promises made to Abraham would joy with her. They do this because they realize that through Isaac would come the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. Isaac, therefore, was to Sarah, and all that share her hope, the son of laughter and rejoicing, as his name signifies. Do you understand now? Uh, yes, Daddy, go on with the story. Meanwhile, the strangers made ready to continue their journey. Before departing, they explained their terrible mission to Abraham. He now knew that they were angels sent from God and perhaps asked them what their purpose was in visiting the earth. They told him that they were about to visit Sodom to punish the city because of the evil conduct of the people who lived there. Abraham was startled and afraid when he heard that. He remembered that Lot was in Sodom and he feared that he might be destroyed with the city. So he pleaded to God to show mercy. He asked, Wilt thou destroy the righteous with the wicked? Genesis 18, verse 23. God will never do that. He is just in all his ways. He willeth not the death of any, but that all should come unto him and live. He will always care for the righteous. And so the angel promised Abraham that God would not destroy Sodom if there were fifty righteous people found in it. But Abraham knew Sodom, and in view of the appearance of the angels, now wondered if there were fifty righteous people in it. 
He therefore came boldly unto the throne of grace, and pleaded that God would not destroy the city if there were forty-five righteous people in it. And when God replied that he would not destroy the city under those conditions, he continued to plead with God until he promised that if ten righteous people were found therein, Sodom would not be destroyed. Having made this agreement with Abraham, the angels continued towards Sodom to punish the wicked city. Chapter 5 The Last Terrible Night of Sodom Towards evening on the same day the angels arrived at Sodom, where a very terrible work of judgment awaited them. Outside the city walls they met a man, who met them with joy, and, full of hospitality, invited them to stay with him for the evening. This man was Lot. Like his uncle Abraham, he did not know that the two men who had come to Sodom were angels. But in his loneliness in Sodom, he rejoiced to meet with some who came from another place. Daddy, asked Anne, why would you say that Lot was lonely in Sodom? He would have had plenty of friends and people about him. There were plenty of people in Sodom, replied her father, but Lot had no friends. In fact, he was a very unhappy man in Sodom, and doubtless wished that he was back with his uncle Abraham. He seemed to have been a weak man. Despite the trouble he had experienced when he was taken captive by King Chetelwamar, he had returned to Sodom, even though the evil surroundings distressed him. How do you know that the evil surroundings distressed him? asked Peter. Because the Bible tells us so. It says, Just Lot was vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, and again, that righteous man, dwelling among them in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. That's in Second Peter chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. Why didn't he leave Sodom and return to Abraham? asked Anne. Unfortunately, his family had made friendships with the people of Sodom and refused to give them up. His two daughters had become engaged to be married to two of the men of Sodom, who were thus called the sons-in-law of Lot, and his wife had entered fully into the social life of the evil city. These things hindered Lot from doing what he should have done. What was that, Daddy? He should have left Sodom and returned to Abraham as a stranger and a pilgrim in the land, looking forward to the fulfillment of the promises. He should have kept separate from those about him, as we should today, lest we be drawn to desire the things of the world more than the things of God. Lot certainly got into a lot of trouble when he left Abraham, remarked Anne. Yes, the choice was a foolish one. He was most unhappy in Sodom. It was a continual worry to him, as the Apostle Peter states in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, and it was not good for a man to be always in such a state. On the other hand, Abraham was happy in his isolation and was able to reflect upon God and his promises without the distractions of Sodom. Did Lot still continue to worship God, even in Sodom? asked Peter. Yes, the record speaks of just Lot and refers to him as righteous. He was the one whom Abraham had in mind when he pleaded with the angel to spare Sodom if ten righteous persons were found therein. Remembering that Lot had several children and a large household of servants, he was convinced that ten righteous would be found in Sodom. At the gate of the city, the angels at first refused the invitation of Lot to enjoy the hospitality of his home that evening. They declared that they would abide in the street all night. Lot was appalled at such a thought and urgently pressed upon them to accept his offer. Why did he do that if they were content to stop in the streets? asked Peter. Lot realized the great danger of doing that, answered his father. Sodom had become like many modern cities of today, where it is not safe to remain in the streets all night. The men of Sodom were very immoral men, and under the cover of darkness were ready to do the most awful things. They had no shame at all, and rejoiced in the worst forms of wickedness and violence. Lot knew that only too well, and so pleaded with the angels to make their way to his house for the night. And finally they agreed to do so. But the men of Sodom heard of the strangers, and, full of wickedness, they surrounded Lot's home with evil intent against them. Lot tried to protect the strangers he had brought into his house, but this only roused the anger of the evil men against him. They turned on him with anger and threats because of his reproaches against them. 
This fellow came to dwell among us, and now he wants to judge over us, they declared. From their words and actions, it is clear that they disliked Lot as much as they worried him. Why is it that people who are evil dislike those who are good? inquired Anne. Because righteousness is always a reproach to wickedness, answered her father. People, whether young or old, who give themselves over to wickedness, always feel a little uncomfortable in the presence of those who do not. They try to justify their actions by ridiculing those who stand aside from such things. They decry them in such terms as goody-goodies, and so ridicule them. When other young people see that you refuse to be involved in their questionable activities, they do not like it, because they know within their hearts that what they do is wrong. So, though you have said nothing, your actions condemn them, and they dislike you for it. That is why it is good that young people who seek to serve God should look for companionship among those who are like-minded. Unfortunately, human nature is such that people are most easily influenced by evil things than by good. This is illustrated by what happened to Lot. The men of Sodom knew that Lot was disgusted with their way of life, and when on this occasion he rebuked them, it roused them to anger. Beside themselves with fury, the men turned on Lot and sought to kill him. But the angel saved his life. They smote the men with blindness, and pulling Lot inside the home, they closed the door against the wicked people outside. And now the angels had seen enough. The wicked city of Sodom was past redemption. The people were beyond reforming. They were so given over to wickedness and violence as to make only one thing appropriate, to destroy both city and people. God determined to pour out his judgment to that end. But what of Lot? He had to be saved, for, as the angels had told Abraham, God will never destroy the righteous with the wicked. So now they proceeded to explain to Lot the intent of the judgment that would be poured out upon the city, and advised him to gather his family together, stressing to all members the need to flee from the city that they might be saved. The Apostle Peter, in commenting upon the incident, declared that it illustrates that God knoweth how to deliver the godly out of trials, and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. With the knowledge that the city was to be destroyed, Lot called all his relations together, urgently pleading with them to flee with him from that place. But as in the days of Noah, they laughed at him. They did not believe in God, and therefore did not think it possible. All night he continued to reason with them, but in vain. At last the time came for the city to be destroyed, and the angels urged Lot to leave immediately with his wife and two daughters. Lot still lingered, however, pleading with the others to come, until the angels, in their mercy, forced him to go, and, leading him out of the city, told him to escape to the mountains, lest he be consumed with the fire of Sodom. But Lot, weary from pleading with his relatives all night, and full of sorrow at the terrible things he had witnessed, asked permission to shelter in a place called Zor, or Little. The angels allowed him to do this, and as he sorrowfully made his way there, the terrible judgment of God roared out of heaven against the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. The earth quaked, volcanic explosions flung immense quantities of lava and rocks up into the air. The light of the sun was blotted out by the pall of black smoke. Forked lightning flashed forth out of the darkness, striking against the evil cities and setting alight to the bituminous soil of the area, turning it into a lake of fire. And then an even more terrifying thing happened. The volcanic eruption and earthquake forced so much of the burning bitumen and lava into the air that the land began to subside. The water of the inland sea rushed in to cover it from view, burying the cities in this watery grave. The minerals brought to the surface by this upheaval turned that once very pleasant land, previously described as being like the Garden of Yahweh, in Genesis 13 verse 10, into the arid, barren, salt-encrusted wilderness that it is today. So terrible was the sight that Lot was afraid to remain in Zor. He fled out of the city with his two daughters and hid in a cave in the mountains. Now he realized how foolish had been his choice in leaving Abram and moving downhill towards Hai, or Ruin, and the cities of the plain. Not only had he lost all his worldly possessions, but also part of his family, including his wife. For as they were fleeing out of Sodom, Lot's wife had looked back. She was saddened at leaving the city. She had not been unduly concerned at the spiritual welfare of her family. 
She had been pleased to observe how prosperous they had become. She rejoiced that they were making such good marriages, for the men who were courting her daughters were very desirable in her eyes. So whilst she felt she had to follow Lot, she did so impatiently. She looked back longingly at the city life she had loved so much. She regretted giving up the pleasures and luxuries to which she had become accustomed and became a pillar of salt. Jesus warns us of this. See what he says in Luke 7, verse 32. Joan quickly found the place and read, Remember Lot's wife. That is the advice of the Lord Jesus to us, commented Mr. Phillips. We live in days similar to those of Lot. It is an age of great violence and wickedness. At school, as in the world, people are becoming more abandoned, more reckless in their wickedness. Yet it is also a time of great affluence. People have more money than ever before. They can enjoy the pleasures of life more than at any time previously. But they do not recognize God as the giver of every good and perfect gift, and are contemptuous of his ways and teaching. Lot's wife had the opportunity to learn of God and to give herself to him in the way that would be pleasing to him but she had become too involved with pleasure and prosperity, and in looking back sorrowfully, she was turned into a pillar of salt. What does that mean? asked Peter. I do not believe that it means that God turned her into salt, but that looking back, and hence delaying to follow Lot, she was overwhelmed with the sulfuric eruption, encrusted with salt, and so died. The lesson of her life teaches us to recognize the value of the truth, and whilst enjoying life as God would have us do, Never lose sight of the better things that are revealed in Christ Jesus. You will find that a person who tries to act as God would have him act is happier by so doing, for God will surely reward him. Now let us consider Abraham. When the angels left him, he was greatly concerned at the outcome of their visit to Sodom and the future of Lot. Next morning he rose very early and made his way to the top of a hill where he could see towards Sodom and Gomorrah. He was anxious concerning the fate of the city. Did it contain ten righteous people? Would it be saved? He had his answer. The smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. The wickedness of the people of Sodom and the destruction of the city are used many times in scriptures to warn people of the consequences of ignoring God's ways. But its greatest message is for today. The prophets of God warned the people of Israel that they would suffer in a similar way if they refused to heed his message. As the men of Sodom knew nothing of the impending destruction until it came, so Christ warned the people of the world would be in ignorance of the truth concerning his coming. We can read about that in Luke 17 verses 28 to 30. We are living in days such as those. The people about us are wicked and unheeding of God so that the day of Jesus Christ's coming will take them unawares. We must be careful that it does not also take us unawares also. If our hearts are in the things of the world, so that we do not heed the words of God, we will be like Lot's wife, destroyed with the wicked when we are trying to escape. Peter taught that the destruction of Sodom was an example of what God would do to the righteous and the wicked. The former will be delivered, but the latter will be punished. Therefore, we do not want to be envious of those about us who seem to enjoy life, while they despise God and His ways. They are not really happy, for it is not long before all their pleasure turns sour, or they tire of them. But in following God's ways, we enjoy life, while we look forward to the prospect of great joy at Christ's coming. Chapter 6. Ishmael Banished from Abraham's Household The days and months sped by in the camp of Abraham, and the time came when Isaac, the joy and pleasure of his mother's heart, should be weaned. So happy were his father and mother in the growth of the little boy that Abraham made a great feast that all could rejoice together. However, about that time, Sarah saw Ishmael mocking her son, Ishmael was fifteen or more years of age at that time, and was growing into quite a big boy. He became jealous of his little half-brother. He remembered the time when all Abraham's love was given to him, and there was much talk of him being heir of his father. As well as teasing Isaac, he ill-treated him also, as sometimes brothers do. This made Sarah very angry, 
and in a rage she told Abraham he must go. Cast out this bondwoman, that is Hagar the slave, and her son, for the son of the bondwoman will not be heir with my son Isaac. You can read that in Genesis 21 verse 10. Her demand seemed unfair to Abraham. He loved Ishmael as well as Isaac, and thought that they should all live together in peace. He did not understand that God was using the jealousy of Ishmael and the anger of Sarah to teach them, and us, of his great purpose in the earth. God therefore told Abraham to do according to Sarah's command, because Isaac was the seed of promise. He told him not to worry about Ishmael, knowing he would care for him, because he is thy seed. This explanation made a great difference to Abraham. He had complete faith that God would do as he promised, and would look after Ishmael. Therefore, next morning, after giving Hagar and Ishmael a supply of food and water, he sent them away. But Hagar had no plans of her own, and when she left Abram's settlement, she did not know what to do. She wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba until the food and water which Abraham had given her were finished, and Ishmael was almost famished by the need for something to eat and drink. The sun burned down on them, as it does in the land of promise, and still they wandered around looking for food and water, getting weaker and weaker, until it seemed as though they must die. Ishmael suffered even more than his mother, and seemed at the very point of death, until at last she laid him under a shrub out of the sun and said, Let me not see the death of my child. This was a terrible ordeal for Hagar and Ishmael. They were at their wit's end, weeping over their sad lot. They did not show great faith in God, for he had promised Abraham that he would look after them, and if they turned to him, he would have shown them where to find water. But God is very merciful and saw their plight. Hagar heard the voice of God asking her, What is the matter, Hagar? Do not fear. God has heard the voice of the lad. Go, lift him up, for I will make of him a great nation. God then directed Hagar to a well of water, and through the water of this well Ishmael revived. God continued to be with the lad as he grew up. He became an archer, married an Egyptian, and became a father of twelve princes. So Ishmael grew into a great nation. The Phillips family had read the story outlined above from Genesis 21, and had no sooner completed it when Anne said indignantly, I cannot understand how Sarah could be so cruel to send Hagar and Ishmael into the wilderness to die. Sarah didn't do that, Anne, replied her father. She merely sent them away from the camp of Abraham. Hagar and Ishmael wandered in the wilderness, it is true, but that was their own choice. I still think she was hard to send poor Ishmael away like that. Well, we do not know the circumstances. Ishmael was jealous of Isaac, and perhaps may have harmed him. I am quite sure that the mocking of Ishmael would be serious enough to justify what Sarah demanded. Otherwise, God would not permit it. Why did God permit it? Because he wished to show his purpose to those who would study this story. How does this story show the purpose of God? asked Anne a little impatiently. I cannot see much in it except to show that Sarah was cruel. That's because you haven't searched to find God's meaning, replied her father. God has a purpose in all that he has placed in the Bible, though sometimes we must think a lot before we can find the true meaning. In fact, the Bible is like a great mystery book. It tells a story and then leaves you to work out the meaning. To do so, we must search for the clues that will solve the problem. Why doesn't God tell us plainly and clearly his meaning? Because he knows it is better for us if we work for the knowledge. He has magnified his word above all his name. That's in Psalm 138 verse 2. And he delights in us thinking upon these things. Malachi 3.16 For by doing so, we ourselves will learn to think as he would like us. You see, God not only cares for our bodies by giving us food and shelter, but also cares for our minds by giving us the Bible. We need to be careful not only in what we eat and how we live, but also how we think and what we read, because these things will affect our lives. If we read only trashy books and silly comics, we will never rise above those things because our thoughts will always be on them. We must select good books to read and seek to understand the Bible, which will help us to think higher thoughts and live better lives. Well, what are the clues in this story? The clues are the two mothers and their sons, Sarah and Hagar, Ishmael and Isaac. Sarah was a free woman, Hagar a bondwoman or slave. 
Both Ishmael and Isaac were the sons of Abraham, but only Isaac was the son of promise. And in the Bible, two kinds of people look to Abraham as their father. Firstly, there are those who believe and obey God, whether they are Jews or Gentiles, and such are called the seed of Abraham. That's in Galatians 3 verse 28. And secondly, there are those Jews who reject the teaching of Jesus Christ, but have nonetheless come from Abraham. The former are like Isaac, the seed of promise. The latter are like Ishmael, and are called the natural seed. Like Ishmael, they are in bondage to the law. Turn to Romans 8, verses 7 and 8, and read it for me, will you, Peter? Peter read, Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. You see, continued Mr. Phillips, Paul refers to the chapter we read tonight to show the difference between mere Jews after the flesh and those who accept Christ. The former are not the children of promise. Ishmael in the chapter we read stands for the natural Jews, and Isaac for those who accept Christ. I thought Ishmael was the father of the Arabs, declared Peter. So he was, but in this chapter he represents the natural Jews. That's confusing, isn't it? No, not really. God often has hidden meanings in the things he reveals. Are you sure you are right in this, Dad? Yes, the Bible tells us so. Paul in Galatians 4 verses 22 to 31 says that the story we have read is an allegory, that is, a story with a hidden meaning. He goes on to show that Ishmael represented those Jews who were under bondage, that is, sons of the bondwoman, to the law of Moses and refused to accept Jesus Christ while Isaac represented those who do accept Christ. In verse 29 he says, And he, that is Ishmael, that was born after the flesh, persecuted him, that is Isaac, that was born after the Spirit. Even so it is now. In the days of Paul, the natural Jews opposed and persecuted those who accepted Jesus, as Ishmael did Isaac in the story we read tonight. Now I have given you the clues. Let us work out the mystery. What is the first thing we read about tonight? It was the feast Abraham gave when Isaac was weaned, said Anne. Yes, when a baby is weaned, its food is changed. Isaac, we have found, represented the true followers of God. These were found at one time among the Jews only, and their spiritual food was the law of Moses. But when Jesus Christ came, the Jews were delivered from the curse of the law. They were weaned and given new food in the teachings of Jesus Christ. Gentiles accepting Jesus Christ became Jews. Uh, how is that? By accepting the teaching of Abraham and the hope of Israel as their hope. But when the disciples went preaching to Gentiles, it made the Jews jealous. They opposed the truth and mocked the Christians as Ishmael mocked Isaac. Many Jews and Gentiles who accepted Jesus were put in prison and ill-treated. And so the Jews who did not receive Jesus, having rejected God, were themselves cast off from him as Ishmael was from the household of Abraham. They soon found themselves, like Ishmael, wandering in the wilderness, despairing of life. What do you mean by that? The Jews, having rejected Jesus, were driven from Palestine into all parts of the world where they have existed without hope. Why were they without hope? Because they rejected Jesus Christ, in whom there is the only way of life. Won't the Jews be in the kingdom of God? Only those who accept Jesus Christ will receive life eternal. But God told Abraham he would look after Ishmael, so that if Ishmael in Genesis 21 represented the Jews, God must look after them, declared Peter. That is true, and concerning the Jewish nation, we can use the words that God used concerning Ishmael. Also the son of the bondwoman will God make a nation, because he is thy, Abraham's, seed. God is today causing the Jews to return from their wilderness wanderings. They will, however, yet go through a time of great trouble, as did Ishmael. But God will hear their cry and deliver them. He will send them Jesus Christ, their Deliverer, who will save them from their troubles. He will bring them back into the land of Israel, where he will make them a great nation, because they are the seed of Abraham, God's friend. In the Bible, God speaks of this and tells the Jews, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the nations whither ye went. 
That's in Ezekiel 36, verse 22. Do you think you understand this? Uh, yes, I, I think so. Well, now here is the lovely part of the story we have considered tonight. As Ishmael wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba and almost died through lack of water, so has the Jew wandered through the nations, ignorant of the water of life which Jesus can provide. Read John 4, verse 14 for me, will you? Anne read, Jesus said, Whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The truth is thus likened by Jesus into a well of water, and as the truth is based upon the promises of God, it can be likened to the well of promise. Of this well of living water the Jews know nothing, and yet are sadly in need. All this was shown to Abraham, for Ishmael wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. Do you know what Beersheba means? No. It means the well of the oath. Ishmael did not know where the well was, and so nearly died of thirst. But God revealed it unto him before it was too late, and so he recovered. This is an allegory of what God will do for the nation of Israel when the Lord Jesus returns. The Jews will not only be gathered to their land, but also taught the truth. They will see in Jesus Christ the one whom they pierced, and they will mourn before God because of their past blindness. That's in Zechariah 12, verse 10. So, like Ishmael, they will be saved by the well of the oath that Jesus will reveal unto them. Then Israel will be made a great nation in the earth, for God has said, As you were a curse among the nations, so I will save you, and ye shall be a blessing. That's in Zechariah 8, verse 13. God will hear their cry in time of trouble, as he did that of Ishmael. Ishmael means, he whom God hears. And they will become a great nation because they are Abraham's seed. All this was revealed to Abraham in the story of Ishmael, long before the Jewish nation existed. This remarkable allegory, revealing the hidden meaning of the Bible, shows that the closer we search its pages, the more wonderful becomes its teaching. As we grow in understanding, its treasure house of knowledge discloses many beautiful truths that are hidden from our eyes by just a casual reading. The Bible becomes like an exciting adventure in understanding. It's like a detective story. We need to prayerfully seek the clues that will reveal the hidden meaning of its message, and gradually, to our delight, its teaching will be revealed. Don't you think that you're stretching the meaning of this chapter too much? asked Peter. No, I do not, replied his father. All that I have told you is explained by the Apostle Paul. He too likens the Bible to a detective story. Where does he do that? In Romans 16, answered his father with a smile. Read verse 25 for me. Peter read, Now to him that is of the power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. There you are, Peter. Paul likens the gospel to the revelation of the mystery. Isn't it the work of a detective to unravel mysteries? Yes, I suppose. That's right. And in the Bible we have a book that will reveal precious secrets to us if we study it correctly. But look, remonstrated Graham, I am inclined to agree with Peter. On what basis have you the right to take a straightforward story, such as that of Hagar and Ishmael, and turn it into a prophecy? I agree that we must exercise care in such matters, replied his father. Remember, I told you that we must search for clues in the Bible, and the Bible clearly explains that the incidents that took place in the life of Abraham were not only historically true, but also they are recorded to reveal God's future purpose. We'll get to the point shortly, I suppose, remarked Peter irreverently of his father to the indignation of Anne. What we want to know, Dad, is where does the Bible state that the history of Genesis can be treated as a parable? That is what I've been wondering also, remarked Graham. Yes, added Anne, it is very interesting to say that Ishmael represented the Jewish people and so forth, but how do we know that it is true? Because the Bible teaches us to do so, explained Mr. Phillips. Please read Galatians 4 verses 22 to 24 for me. Anne quickly found the place and read, it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid and the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, and he who was of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, 
which is Hagar. Thank you, Anne, remarked her father. Notice that the Apostle Paul likens the things that we have been discussing to an allegory. This means that God has selected historical incidents and recorded them as allegories to teach important lessons. A recognition of this provides a key to Genesis and to the interpretation of events recorded there. The incidents that took place happened, but they are recorded for two reasons. One, they are historically true. And two, they reveal a hidden meaning. God chose to record incidents that had such a twofold meaning. That is why the life of Joseph is given in such detail in the book of Genesis. It shows that the book is divine. Why does it do that? asked Peter, interrupting his father, whose tendency was to become a little warm and loquacious when he discussed a favorite topic. In an ordinary book, written by human agency, greater prominence would have been given to the life of Judah, because he developed into the most important tribe, explained Mr. Phillips. But instead, attention is given to the life of Joseph, and it is set before us in great detail. Why is that, do you think? We were taught the reason in Sunday school, said Joan. The teacher told us that the life of Joseph, Jacob's favorite son, is a parable of the Lord Jesus Christ, the beloved son of God. We had to write it down on paper. Yes, agreed Mr. Phillips, and it shows the marvelous foreknowledge of God. He moved Moses to record the life of Joseph in greater detail because it, too, is an allegory pointing to the life of the Lord Jesus. The fact that Christ's life is so clearly foreshadowed in the life of Joseph is an indication of the inspiration of the Bible, for it reveals the prophetic insight of Almighty God. I hope you can understand this, for you will find it important in the better understanding of the Bible. We'll give it some thought, answered Peter a little cheekily. Chapter 7 Abraham's Greatest Example of Faith One of the greatest attributes that we can acquire is faith. Paul declares that without faith it is impossible to please God. Hebrews 11 verse 6 He also explains how we can develop it, stating that faith cometh by hearing the word of God. Romans 10 verse 17 The Apostle John wrote that faith will gain for us the victory in the battle of life in 1 John 5, verse 4. It will enable us to look beyond the present to the time when the Lord Jesus will reign on earth, when present trials and problems will give place to the glory and joy of the kingdom of God. Given enough faith, there is nothing that can defeat us. Faith will motivate us to rise above every test imposed. It is important, however, to match our faith with courage, for one is necessary to help the other. That is the lesson of Genesis 22. It records the great test that God brought upon Abraham. The manner in which he reacted to that trial earned for him the title of the Father of the Faithful, for through faith he triumphed. James declared that Abraham was justified by works when he offered up his son and claimed that faith without works is dead. James 2.22 Though the narrative in Genesis states that God did tempt Abraham, elsewhere we are told that God does not tempt man, James 1.13. The word in Genesis is better rendered test. See the revised version. Though God does not tempt man to sin, he does test those whom he desires to remold so as to fit them for his kingdom. Accordingly, Abraham was instructed to take Isaac, the son of promise, the boy of laughter and joy, as his name signifies, and offer him for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains whither God would direct him, located in the land of Moriah. We can enter into the feelings of Abraham when he received the command of God, for any parent would experience the greatest distress in putting to death a beloved child. In fact, parents generally would prefer to die for their children rather than see them die. Why then did God demand this of him? By doing so, he taught Abraham, and therefore us, the great price that was paid for the redemption of those who seek his salvation. For God is a father, and Jesus Christ is his son. And as God is capable of the greatest feelings for those who suffer, see Isaiah 63 verse 9, he would have felt for his son as Abraham did for Isaac. We shall see that all the little incidents in this wonderful story are important and well worth noting. 
For example, the word Mariah means seen of God. And we can understand how the great creator would watch with sympathy and understanding the trial of his friend. Mariah was the place where later Solomon built the temple of God, 2 Chronicles 3 verse 1, and concerning which Moses said God did choose to put his name there, Deuteronomy 12 verse 5. We are not told which of the mountains it was, but it was most likely Mount Golgotha, where, many hundreds of years later, the Lord Jesus was put to death as a sin offering. It is, therefore, a very important place, and well-named Moriah, or Scene of God, for the eyes of the Lord are always upon it. Deuteronomy 11, verse 11. One day it will become the site of the capital city of the world. Jeremiah 3, verse 17. For Jerusalem will extend to that area. Jeremiah 31, verses 39 to 40. And the Lord Jesus will reign there, and with him in glory will be Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and other men and women of faith. What are Abraham's feelings when he received this command from God? What would be the feelings of any father for his dearly beloved son? Every word of the command would be a dagger in his heart. But Abraham was a man of faith. It had been faith that had caused him to leave Ur of the Chaldees for the promised land. It had been faith that kept him in the ways of truth during his wanderings. His faith had been strengthened as he had experienced the goodness of God throughout his life. And although he knew that obedience to the command he had received would bring about the death of Isaac, he recognized that God would have to raise him from the dead in order to fulfill the promises he had made. Had not God told him that through Isaac would come the promised seed, Jesus Christ? Had he not said that through him would come the blessing? Had not God instructed Abraham to send Ishmael away from Isaac because Isaac was to be his heir? As Abraham thought on these things, his conviction was strengthened that though God had called upon him to slay his son, he must restore him in order that the promises might be fulfilled. He knew that God was able to raise him up from the dead. It says that in Hebrews 11 verse 19. He could see that this was a great test of faith, and he determined within himself to carry it out. Therefore, without delay, early next morning, this grand old man of faith set forth on his terrible journey. The wood for the burnt offering was prepared. The ass upon which Abraham rode was saddled. And with Isaac and two young men servants he set out. Three days later they reached the place selected by God. What terrible days these must have been! All the time Abraham would be thinking of the terrible deed he had to do at the end of that time. To him Isaac was as good as dead. It reminds us of the three terrible days when Jesus was in the grave. At the foot of the mount, Abraham told the young men to wait while he and Isaac ascended to worship, after which he said, We will come again to you. How could Abraham say this when God had told him he was to offer up his son? Because he recognized that for God to be true to his promise, he would have to raise his son to life again. And his faith was such that he was convinced that God would do so. And so Abraham, and the son of laughter and joy, commenced to climb the mount. But there was no joy in that occasion. The heart of Abraham was sad, and being an old man, whilst Isaac was a strapping young man of about seventeen, and probably well built from his outdoor life, he laid the wood of the burnt offering upon Isaac. About nineteen hundred years later, they laid the wood of the cross on Jesus, as he wearily ascended the mount upon which he was to meet his death. John 19, verse 17. Meanwhile, Isaac was still in ignorance of the purpose of the journey, beyond knowing that it was for worship. So, as they went up the mount, he said to his father, We have the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And to this question the man of faith answered, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. From this we know that Abraham saw something more in the sacrifice of Isaac than a mere trial of faith. Centuries later, the Lord Jesus Christ declared that Abraham saw my day and was glad. John 8.56 From this it appears that Abraham recognized that in the things he enacted there was a foreshadowing of the sacrifice and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, who was called the Lamb of God, slain for the sin of the world. And so they came to the dread spot where Isaac was to be the sacrifice. And with heaving, anxious heart, Abraham set about building the altar and laying the wood thereupon. 
By now Isaac too would have known of the part that he was to enact in the trial, and being a young man of great faith like his father, and doubtless being encouraged by him to submit to the command of God, he offered himself as a willing sacrifice. Like Abraham, he knew that God would richly reward him if he trustingly gave himself in that way. So he steeled himself to do so. At last the altar was built. The wood was laid in order upon it. Isaac, the son of happiness and joy, was bound, and the terrible moment came. Abraham stretched forth his hand, and strong in faith he uplifted the knife to slay his son, fully determined to do the bidding of God. But as he made ready for the fatal blow, the voice of God was heard, Abraham, Abraham, lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him, for now I know thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, from me. What a relief for Abraham and Isaac! How their hearts would turn in thankfulness to God, in gratitude that he had not demanded the life of Isaac. They still desired to worship him, but what could they offer? Looking around, Abraham saw a ram caught in a thicket by the horns. With trembling hands, he released Isaac, whom he had thus received, as Paul comments, as from the dead, and offered the ram in place of his son. As he did so, the revelation came to him that what he had done was a type of what God would accomplish in the Redeemer that he had promised to Eve in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3.15. He explained this to Isaac. He called the name of the place Yahweh Yira, and declared, In the mount of Yahweh it shall be seen. In that same spot would have been the great provision that Yahweh would provide for the salvation of those who seek him in faith. The voice of the angel had directed Abraham to the ram provided of God through which Isaac, the seed of Abraham, was saved out of death. By now Abraham heard the angel the second time, Genesis 22, verse 15. All that the angel had said on the first occasion had relation to sacrifice, such as the Lord experienced at his first coming. It had saved Isaac from death, and thus pointed forward to the first advent of the Lord, when he came as the Lamb of God for the sin of the world, to be brought from the dead by a resurrection to life eternal. But the second declaration of the angel had relation to events that will be fulfilled at the second coming of the Lord. He declared, By myself I have sworn, saith Yahweh, because you have done this, and have not held back your son, your only son, I will bless you beyond words. I will greatly multiply your seed, so as to compare with the stars of heaven and the sand on the seashore for numbers. Your seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and through your seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. With this blessing ringing in their ears, we can understand with what happiness and joy Abraham and Isaac would descend the mount to make their way back to Beersheba, where Sarah was anxiously awaiting the outcome of the journey of her husband and son. The whole family would rejoice that its members had all come through a dreadful trial in a way that vindicated their faith and honored their God. That is one of the greatest chapters of the Bible, remarked Mr. Phillips enthusiastically after the family had completed the reading of Genesis 22. It is one that helps us to understand the great love of God. I cannot understand why you say that, commented Anne slowly as she pondered what she had read. To me it is a terrible chapter. It seems cruel that God would ask Abraham to offer his son as a burnt offering. But God did not allow him to carry it out, did he? continued Mr. Phillips with a smile. No, but what difference does that make? God caused Abraham unnecessary tension and sorrow, it seems to me interjected Graham. That is because you do not understand what God was trying to teach Abraham and also us, answered his father. We feel for Abraham because we can enter into his feelings, and we know what a terrible thing it would be for a father to have to put to death his son in that way. But you know, we take for granted that God allowed his son to be put to death as a sacrifice, and as God has feelings and is capable of anger, love, compassion, and so forth, he would have felt for his son as Abraham did for Isaac. But God would know that Jesus would be raised from the dead, said Anne. True, commented her father, but he would feel for his son just the same. 
Remember, Jesus knew that Lazarus would be granted life again, but we are told that he wept at the graveside. And to show that God feels for his people, even though he punishes them in his love, please read Isaiah 63, verse 9. There was a scurry of pages being turned as each of the children tried to outdo the other in finding the place first. Peter won the contest and read, In all their affliction he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity he redeemed them, and he bare them and carried them all the days of old. Thank you, said Mr. Phillips. That verse is dealing with the way in which God felt for his people as they wandered through the wilderness. They were disobedient, and he punished them, but at the same time he felt for them. Notice the expressions in the verse. He was afflicted in his love, in his pity he carried them. Those words speak of compassion, consideration, concern, and so forth. It teaches us that we can turn to God with every confidence, knowing that he is the one who can help us, who desires to help us, who feels for us. When Abraham was told to offer his son, he learned what a great sacrifice God offered when he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, as we read in John 3.16. Do you understand that? Yes, I think so, answered Anne. But now Peter had a comment to make. I can't see much difference between the promise made to Abram in Genesis 12 and the one we read this evening. They both concern the same things. The difference is a very important one, replied his father. In Genesis 12, God made promises to Abraham, but there were conditions attached. They were promised to him if he obeyed God. But in Genesis 22, Abraham showed how completely he was prepared to obey, and therefore there was no conditions attached. God says now to Abraham, I will bless thee. Paul in Hebrews 6 verse 15 says, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. What did God mean when he said Abraham's seed would possess the gate of his enemies? asked Anne. You know who the seed is, of course, replied her father. Yes, you have told us before. It is Jesus Christ. Yes, now when Jesus Christ returns and sets up his power on earth, will all the nations accept him at first? Mm, no, not all. Some will. Can you give me a Bible quotation showing this? Mm, no, I, I can't. Well, here are some. Revelation 11, verse 18. Isaiah 60, verse 12. Psalm 2, verse 8. Daniel 2, verse 44. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, 24, says that he shall put down all rule and authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. So you see, Christ will triumph over all his enemies over all people who oppose his teaching, as Abraham was told. But I still don't know what is meant by possessing the gate of his enemies. It means having power over them. In ancient times, towns and fortresses were walled up, and the only way to enter in was by gates let into the walls. For a commander to possess the gate of a walled city or fortress would be to have it in his power, for he would then control anybody or anything entering or leaving. Hence that fortress would be subject to him. Also in ancient times, the gates of such cities were of greatest importance. There its rulers and judges would take their place with great pomp and would sit to administer the laws of the land. It was a convenient place to hear any complaints from the people or to decide the rights and wrongs of cases presented to them for consideration. Thus, when God told Abraham that his seed would possess the gate of his enemies, he promised him that Jesus Christ would overcome his enemies and rule over them. Daniel 2.44 illustrates this. It states, The God of heaven shall set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Again, we're told in Isaiah 60 verse 12, The nations and the kingdoms that will not serve thee shall perish. Yea, those nations shall be utterly wasted. The promise to Abraham in this place states that his promised seed, the Lord Jesus Christ, shall first overthrow all opposition to his rule and afterwards bring the blessings of his reign to all mankind. By that means, as Abraham was told, in thy seed shall all nations be blessed. The way in which they shall be blessed is outlined in such places as Isaiah 2 verses 2 to 4 and elsewhere. 
Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh. What does that mean? asked Peter. The name should be Yahweh-Yira, replied his father. That is the name of God, and the term means Yahweh will provide. What did Abraham expect God to provide? asked Anne. A suitable sacrifice by which should come a resurrection to life eternal. That sacrifice was provided by the Lord Jesus Christ, concerning whom it is said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. It says that in John 1.29. By taking away sin, or causing it to be forgiven, the Lord Jesus made it possible for men to look forward in hope to a resurrection to life eternal. Without him, the promises of God to Abraham would have been of no value. So Abraham, seeing in these things lessons pointing forward to the Lord Jesus, called the place Yahweh Yira, the Lord will provide. Do you think Abraham would understand that these things pointed forward to Jesus Christ? asked Peter. I am certain of it, for Jesus himself declared that he did. He said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. It says that in John 8.56. Abraham saw it in promise. And he not only saw the first coming of Jesus 1900 years ago, when he was crucified, but also his second coming, when he will be a great king in the earth and all nations will obey him. That is what made him glad. Genesis 24 verse 14 says, In the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. What is meant by that? The mount of the Lord is Mount Zion. It was in the hills close to Zion where Isaac was offered, and it was in that same place where were fulfilled the lessons shown to Abraham in this chapter. There, close to Mount Zion, God's only begotten son, whom he loved, was offered as a sacrifice. When we think of how terrible were the feelings of Abraham as he took up the knife to slay his son, we understand better the great price that was paid that we might have life. But in Mount Zion in the future, there will also be seen the glory of the Lord Jesus when he comes to reign in Jerusalem and before his ancients, including Abraham, gloriously. That's Isaiah 24 verse 23. Then it will be seen by men everywhere that God has provided all things necessary for eternal life. That is the meaning of the words, In the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. For in that mount was, and shall be, seen the fulfillment of all that the angel declared on the two occasions he addressed Abraham in the land of Moriah. Chapter 8 Abraham Purchases the Cave of Machpelah Shortly after his great trial of faith, Abraham moved from Beersheba to Hebron, and there, at the age of 127 years, Sarah died. Sorrowfully, Abraham made preparations to bury his wife, who had been such a loving and helpful companion to him over the years. She had shared with him his joys and sorrows, and encouraged him in his life of faith. How different was she to the wife of Lot, who hated to leave Sodom with its pleasures! Now Sarah was dead, and though Abraham sorrowed, it was not without hope, for he knew that Sarah will be brought again from the dead when the Lord Jesus returns. In that day she, with Abraham, will enter upon a life that will have no sorrow, and will rejoice in an honored position in the land where they wandered as strangers nearly four thousand years ago. Meanwhile Abraham had no place to bury his wife. Though God had promised all the land to him for an everlasting possession, Abraham had not been given so much as to put his foot on. It says that in Acts 7 verse 5. He therefore had to purchase some land, and for that purpose he went to the gate of the town of Hebron. It was at such a place that people gathered to buy and sell, or to discuss their problems and make known their disputes. Abraham was a stranger among the men of Hebron. They knew him as the Hebrew or the man who had passed over the river. Nevertheless, though he was a stranger, or one who kept himself separate and apart from them, they knew of him and highly respected him. And so Abraham stood before the man in the gate, and bowing before them in the manner of the east, he told them the sad news concerning Sarah, and reminded them that as a stranger and sojourner among them, he had nowhere to bury his wife. Politely they invited him to make a selection of any suitable burying place. Again Abraham arose before them, 
and again bowing, he politely requested the cave of Machpelah, which belonged to a man of Hebron named Ephron. Now Ephron was among those who were at the gate, and on hearing the request of Abraham, whom he had called a mighty prince, he stood up, and in the custom of the people of the east, he offered the cave to Abraham as a gift. But as Abraham had refused the gifts of the king of Sodom in Genesis 14, so he refused the gift of Ephron. The only gift he wanted was the gift of God. He insisted on paying for the cave and asked the price. And for 400 shekels of silver, Abraham received the cave and its surrounding field. And there Sarah was buried. Abraham's purchase of this small piece of land is recorded in the Bible to emphasize that he never received in his lifetime the land promised him of God. Stephen made that perfectly clear when he defended his belief before the Jerusalem Sanhedrin as recorded in Acts 7. He declared that Abraham came into the land where the Jews in that day dwelt, and God gave him none inheritance in it, no, not so much as to set his foot on. Yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession and to his seed after him, when as yet he had no child. That's in Acts 7 verses 4 and 5. All the land that Abraham possessed in his lifetime was his by purchase. The land God promised him will be given him when, at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, he will be brought again from the dead. Meanwhile, at the death of Sarah, he purchased the cave of Machpelah as a family place of burial. Later, Abraham too was laid to rest in the same cave, and the bodies of Abraham and Sarah, together with others of his family, remain there to this day. When they awake from their sleep of death, they will discover that nearly 4,000 years of history have passed. They will find some of their descendants back in the land, and they will learn how their example of faith and righteousness has helped many men and women and boys and girls to know God a little better. Many people have been inspired by the wonderful example set by faithful Abraham and by his companion Sarah, who gave up the ease of city life to humbly follow her husband in his lonely wanderings, always selflessly encouraging him in his life of faith. She shared his trials, and with him will share the rewards in the age to come. Meanwhile, she rests beside him in the cave of Machpelah, awaiting the great day of the resurrection, when sorrow shall be turned into joy, because death shall be swallowed up in victory. Chapter 9 Abraham Seeks a Wife for Isaac This chapter shows how anxious Abraham was that Isaac should have a suitable wife, declared Mr. Phillips after the family had read Genesis 24. Because he was very old and knew he would soon die, he realized it was important that Isaac should marry and have children. Why was that so important? asked Anne. Because the promises that God had made to Abraham depended upon it. God had told him that his seed would develop into a great nation, and that after Abraham's death there would arise one from amongst that number who by his perfect obedience would be raised from the dead and so open the way whereby a resurrection to life eternal would be possible for all the faithful. That one is Jesus Christ. All the promises that God had made to Abraham depended upon the coming of this righteous seed, so a suitable ride for Isaac was important. But forty years had passed since the son of happiness and joy had been born, and still no wife could be found for him. Weren't there any girls in Canaan? asked Peter. There were plenty of young ladies in Canaan, replied his father, and doubtless many of them were very pretty. But because of the wickedness of the people, and because they would have nothing to do with the true God, they were unsuitable for Isaac. It is very important that a man and his wife should be of one belief, otherwise the home will soon become divided, and the worship of God, the most important thing of life, will then be hindered or neglected. Bitter arguments may arise, and instead of the home being a place of peace and happiness, it can become one full of discord and hate. Because of that, God has carefully instructed those who would live in obedience to him to be careful with regard to whom they select for wife or husband. The Jews were commanded to marry only those of their own race, and Paul, in 2 Corinthians 6 verse 14, wrote, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Young people need to remember also that true beauty means much more than a pretty face 
and true wealth cannot be measured by a bank balance. Beauty and wealth often lie unseen in the heart and are shown by obedience to God and in thoughtful, loving action to others. A pretty face can hide a selfish and vain character or a bad temper that may make life unpleasant. The years go by and good looks may fade, but true beauty increases in loveliness with time and true love between husband and wife grows with the years as they help each other toward the kingdom of God. Marriage was created by God in order that each party might help in the needs of the other. But selfishness or opposition in the home can destroy all that. Better for young people to immediately break off friendships with others if they are not interested in God's truth. Otherwise, friendship might blossom into love and end in an attachment that can cause much unhappiness. Love based upon the truth, however, is a very wonderful thing. But I am getting a little poetical perhaps thinking of your mother, and what I am saying can only be appreciated by experience. I had better return to the story. Yes, I think you'd better, commented Mrs. Phillips. Just a moment, Daddy, interrupted Anne. What if a person lived in isolation, away from the ecclesias? If they are seeking a partner for life, they must try and convert such to a knowledge of the truth. If they need to make it a matter of prayer, remembering the words of Proverbs 18.22, Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favor of Yahweh. I see. There being no wife for Isaac in Canaan, continued Mr. Phillips, Abraham called his trusted servant Eliezer to send him on a difficult mission of selecting one for him. This was a strange request, and because Abraham was so particular, it was a task that Eliezer did not like to undertake. What if I am not successful, he inquired. Shall I then take Isaac back to Haran, so that he can make choice for himself? This suggestion horrified Abraham. God had told him to get out of Ur and Haran, and under no circumstances would he return. He had left those places forever. He had prayed to God to bless Eliezer in his mission, and was confident that he would guide him in the matter. He therefore told Eliezer to not worry too much, but to go to the city of Haran where, as you remember, Abraham's brother Nahor had remained, and there seek a wife for Isaac. How could Abraham be so sure that God would help Eliezer? asked Anne. Because God had told Abraham that through Isaac would come the one in whom the promises would be fulfilled. Genesis 21 verse 12. He therefore knew that God would see that Isaac had a wife in due time. Men of lesser faith than Abraham may have become over-anxious, and as the years sped by, they may have tried to obtain a wife by their own means, even if she were not altogether suitable but Abraham had sufficient faith to leave the matter with God. It was a hard thing to ask Eliezer to do, wasn't it? asked Peter. Yes, I certainly would not like to go to a strange town and select a wife for another man. But Eliezer, having sworn to Abraham that he would follow his instructions, took ten camels, and loading them with his luggage and some valuable presents, he set off on his strange mission. As Eliezer jogged on his way on the back of one of the leading camels, with all the others strung behind him in the care of servants, he thought about his strange task, planning how to go about it. At last he came to the busy town of Haran, which was the crossroads of the caravan routes in those times, and outside of which was a large well where the people came for their drinking water. This was the town where Nahor had settled, and among whose daughters Eliezer had to find a wife for Isaac. And there he prayed that God would bless him. Read the prayer again, will you, Anne? and read Genesis 24, verse 12. And he said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day, and show kindness unto my master Abraham. Behold, I stand here by the well of water, and the daughters of the men of the city come out to draw water, and let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, Let down thy pitcher, I pray thee, that I may drink, and she shall say, Drink, and I will give thy camels drink also, let the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac, and thereby shall I know that thou hast shown kindness unto my master. Thank you, Anne, said Mr. Phillips. Eliezer had not finished his prayer when he saw a young woman approaching the well with a pitcher on her shoulder. He could tell from her face that she was not only a girl of great beauty, but a fine character. Was this the wife for Isaac? He approached her as she filled her pitcher at the well and asked, Let me, I pray thee, drink a little water of thy pitcher. And Rebekah replied, 
Drink, Lord, and I will give thy camels drink also. This was the sign that Eliezer had asked of God, but he still wondered whether it had happened by chance. In any case, the girl had been kind to him, and so taking some of the valuable presents he brought, he gave them to her. He then asked who she was, and whether her family could lodge him for the evening. Rebekah then told him her name, saying, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, which she bare unto Nahor. We have both straw and provender enough, and room to lodge in. Eliezer now realized that here was the bride for Isaac. The young lady before him, who was so well named Rebekah, was a niece of Abraham's, and the sign he had asked of God had been fulfilled. He realized that the angel had guided him in his way, and bowing his head, he thanked God for the kindness he had shown unto Abraham his master. Before you go on, Dad, interrupted Graham, why do you say that Rebekah was well named? Because the word Rebekah means a rope with a noose. That's a funny name, said Anne. I cannot see how you can say that's well named. A rope with a noose, or Rebecca, means a young woman whose great beauty ensnares men. Oh, I see. Meanwhile, Rebecca had hastened back home to tell her people of her strange encounter with a stranger, and how he had wanted to lodge with them that evening. Laban, her brother, therefore, as head of the family, went outside the city to welcome Eliezer to their home. Why did Rebecca's father go and welcome the stranger? asked Peter. Wouldn't he be the head? Unfortunately, both Nahor, Rebekah's grandfather, and Bethuel, her father, were dead, and Laban, who was her elder brother, had taken their place. He therefore went out and brought Eliezer back to their home. The camels were attended to and a meal prepared. But before Eliezer would eat, he was determined to complete his mission. He gave him the news of Abraham, how God had blessed him and given him much wealth, how he had an only son of Sarah named Isaac, who would inherit all he had, but for whom he desired a wife of beauty and character, how he had been sent on his mission, and having made it a matter of prayer, had been led by God to Rebekah. And now he wanted to know if his mission were successful. Were they willing that Rebekah should become Isaac's wife? There was only one answer to this. Rebekah's people believed in God, and could see that the matter went beyond their wishes. Laban and Bethuel answered, This matter comes from God, and we dare not say yes or no to you. Here is Rebekah. Let her be the wife of your master's son, as God has spoken. But I thought you said that Bethuel was dead, said Peter with a note of triumph in his voice at catching his father out. Bethuel, Rebekah's father, was dead, replied Mr. Phillips and that is why the record speaks of her mother's house. The Bethuel of verse 50 was evidently a son of Rebekah's father, and with Laban, his elder brother, interviewed Eliezer on behalf of their sister. Oh, I see. Eliezer's mission was now complete, nor did he forget that it was due to the loving guidance of God. Bowing to the earth, he thanked him for his kindness to Abraham. He then brought out many costly presents for Rebekah, her mother, and her brother after which they feasted together, and then retired for the night. Next morning, Eliezer was up early and ready to depart. But Rebekah's mother and brother did not want her to leave so soon. They asked him to stay for a few days. But Eliezer knew how Abraham would be anxiously awaiting the result of his mission. He was keen to return. God had blessed him, and now his work was over. Hinder me not, he asked. Rebekah was called. She was asked, Will you go with this man? And she replied, I will go. And so, with her maidservants and with Deborah her nurse, they commenced the journey back. Rebekah passed over the river and came into the land that God had promised Abraham and Isaac. Down through the land of promise, the little caravan of camels wended its way, and as they went, Eliezer doubtless told Rebekah of the promises of God and how this land was to be given to Abraham and Isaac forever by a resurrection from the dead. They passed over the Jordan and moved up the valley toward Shechem, then down the glorious hill country of central Palestine, where the wooded slopes of the hills and mountains rise on either side. Finally, after a long and tiring journey, they came into the flat country of the south and moved to Beersheba, where Abraham had established his headquarters. Meanwhile, Isaac would visit his father, and at that time he was dwelling further south at a place called the Well Laharoi, which means the well of life and vision. 
There, one evening, as he walked in the field and meditated upon the ways of God, he saw in the far distance Eliezer's line of camels wending their way back home. As they came closer, Eliezer and Rebekah saw Isaac. There is my master's son, he told Rebekah. For the first time Rebekah saw her future husband, the one for whom she had left home and had traveled many miles in trust and faith. She took a veil and covered herself. What did she do that for? asked Anne. It was a custom of those times, and indicated modesty and subjection. Rebecca wanted to show Isaac that she would be a dutiful wife to him. The veil was used as a symbol to show that she looked to him as her lord, and that she would care for him as Sarah had done for Abraham. In that way, those women of old provided a wonderful example. Read 1 Peter 3 verse 6 for me, will you, Joan? Joan read, Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, as long as you do well and are not afraid with any amazement. The previous verse shows that those women trusted in God and were in subjection to their husbands, continued Mr. Phillips. They shared with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob all the difficulties of their lonely life and supported them in their worship of God and are thus set forth as an example for other brides to follow. What does it mean by the words, are not afraid with any amazement, asked Graham. The revised version renders it better, replied his father. It reads, placing implicit trust in God. That is what Rebecca did when she left her home for Isaac. We can imagine what joy there must have been in the camp of Abraham that night when the patriarch saw the beautiful bride that God had chosen for his son. They were married shortly after, and as Sarah had died some years earlier, Rebecca took over the charge of Abraham's household as the bride of the son of promise. I always liked that part of the story, Daddy, said Anne. I once took the part of Eliezer in a play at Sunday school. It is one of the most beautiful stories in the Bible, answered her father, and one, too, that has a meaning for us today. How, how do you mean? In Isaac, Abraham was taught to see a type of the great son who would come, and through whom he would receive the promises, even the Lord Jesus Christ. And this chapter points forward to one of the most glorious things yet to happen to the Lord and all those who are faithful to him. I cannot see how that is so. The marriage of Isaac and Rebekah is like a parable, pointing forward to the time when Jesus Christ will be united forever with those who have lived according to the commandments of God. In this parable, Isaac represents Jesus Christ, and Rebekah represents the faithful believers in him. Paul called the believers of his day the bride of Christ, and likened them to a chaste virgin engaged to be married. That's in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2. When the Lord Jesus returns to the earth, those faithful will be raised from the dead and given eternal life and united with him. In the book of Revelation, that union is likened to a wonderful marriage. That's in Revelation 19, verses 7 and 9. Rebecca was beautiful, and so also will be Christ's bride, the Ecclesia. Rebecca separated herself from her people to marry Isaac and the faithful come aside from the world to marry Christ. Laban and Milcah tried to delay Rebekah, but she refused to stop, saying she would go with the messenger from Abraham, and the faithful also will refuse to heed the counsel of those who would hinder them from commencing a journey that will take them to Christ. They too become veiled when they are baptized, for this is a symbol of their modesty and subjection to their master and lord. And as at even time, Rebekah saw Isaac and married him was placed in the charge of Abraham's house. So in the last days of the Gentiles, the faithful will see Jesus and, as Abraham's seed, will inherit the promise. That's in Galatians 3 verse 28. One final lesson in the story we have read tonight. Like Abraham, Rebekah had crossed over the river and become a true Hebrew. We must do likewise. Mm -hmm.